in listen only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Laura Fuller, Communications Officer with the UNEP Enlighten Initiative and welcome to today's webinar. Our feature presentations are focused on the Enlighten Initiative and the section of the Efficient Lighting Toolkit that deals specifically with the environmentally sound management of lighting products. This is Section 5 which is entitled Safeguarding the Environment and Health. We are fortunate to have two expert panelists representing the United Nations Environment Program and Ambilamp presenting on this topic today. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the microphone and speakers option in the audio pane on the right-hand side of your screen. By doing so, we will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin should you choose to dial in. We ask that you please mute your audio device before the presentations begin. If you have technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 and they will be able to assist you. And we welcome you to introduce yourself and you can do so by typing into the chat pane located on your screen where I have uh, entered in a welcome message. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your questions also. You can type in a question at any point during the presentations. An audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Enlighten website afterwards. You can also ask additional questions from the Contact Us feature on our website, which we can address at a further time. So we have a very exciting agenda prepared for you today, and it's focused on the importance of the environmentally sound management of lighting products. We're fortunate to have Catherine Conway from the United Nations Environment Program, who will provide information from the Enlighten Initiative's new Efficient Lighting Toolkit, and Juan Carlos Enrique Moreno, who will go into detail about best practices for the collection and recycling of lamps. And he is the Director General from Ambilamp, located in Spain. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I'm going to provide a short, informative overview of the Enlighten Initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session and wrap up the discussion with closing remarks. So the Enlighten Initiative was established in 2009 to accelerate a global transformation to energy efficient lighting. We have set a target date that by the end of 2016, all countries should have either phased out inefficient incandescent lamps or at least have some policy in place to phase out within an identified timeline. The initiative provides expert guidance, recommendations, and tools to assist developing and emerging countries to achieve a transition to efficient lighting. This includes the harmonization and promotion of minimum energy perf performance standards, or MEPs, and recommendations that include global best practices. The Global Partnership Program is a key initiative of Enlighten, and it provides technical advice and targeted research and support for the coordination of regional activities around the world. To date, we're happy to say that 46 countries have joined the partnership program, and we expect more to join soon. These are countries who are committed to phasing out inefficient incandescent lamps by 2016, and in fact, some pilot workshops are already being held in selected countries around the world. So the Enlighten Initiative is really an excellent example of a successful public-private partnership and it's supported by the Global Environment Facility and partners Philips Lighting, Osram AG and the National Lighting Test Center of China. To achieve a transition following an integrated approach that's recommended by the Enlighten Initiative, we're providing key resources to countries and here are some of them. For instance, Enlighten has convened government representatives and international lighting experts from over 40 organizations to provide technical, policy, and capacity building support as part of our expert task forces. 
We have released country lighting assessments, which have been developed for over 100 countries, and they highlight the potential savings that can be realized by each country with a shift to efficient lighting in the residential, commercial, industrial, and outdoor lighting sectors. The new Global Efficient Lighting Policy Map, which is on our website, rates activity levels for four elements of the integrated policy approach in the residential sector and shows the readiness of countries to transition to efficient lighting. The Efficient Lighting Toolkit has been developed to communicate the benefits and tools necessary for the adoption of efficient lighting products, and this is what we're focusing on today with Section 5. It's available now on our website as an ebook, and it is currently in Spanish, English, and French, and it'll soon be posted in Arabic and Russian. The new Enlightened Learning Microsite, which is destined to go live very soon, will provide countries with tools, expert advice, presentations, policy information, and technical resources. We've we're also scheduling a global policy dialogue to be convened in 2013 to address policy issues and the emergence of LEDs, a very important new technology. At this prominent event, a global lighting status report will also be released for review and input to be finalized towards the end of the year. And lastly, the UNEP Collaborating Center has recently been launched in Beijing, China as a partnership between UNEP and the National Lighting Test Center. This is an accredited facility that provides lighting testing, training, advice, quality control, and capacity building to support developing and emerging countries. So as you can see, the Enlighten Initiative is providing a wide range of support for all countries and stakeholders than for those people who are interested in a rapid transition to energy efficient lighting. Now I'd like to provide a brief, brief introduction of our distinguished panelists. We are joined by our guest speaker, Mr. Juan Carlos Enrique, who is Director General at Ambilamp. And Mr. Enrique currently serves as this Director General, and he's based in Madrid, Spain. In this role, he's responsible for the creation of a reverse logistical network for lamp waste collection that allows Spanish lighting producers to achieve both their collection and re recycling targets as dictated by Spanish European law. Previous to this, he worked for Philips Lighting, where he held positions such as managing, marketing director and institutional relations manager. He has experience working in the nuclear power plant industry and holds various engineering and business degrees. Welcome to Mr. Enrique. Then, for our first speaker today, we will have Catherine Conway, who's a program officer in the Division of Technology, Industry, and Economics at UNEP. And she provides very important technical support for the Enlighten Initiative. Catherine, um, is based here in Paris, France, and she is an expert in energy efficient lighting technologies and energy policy. She was previously a professor and a consultant and has more than two decades of experience in global market lighting market transformation efforts. So at this point, um, I would like to introduce Ms. Conway to begin her presentation. Thank you very much. Greetings, this is Catherine Conway. I'm going to be giving you a quick look at one of the sections of the Efficient Lighting Toolkit that we recently published. Uh, as Laura mentioned, it's Section 5, Safeguarding the Environment and Health. Then we'll take a look at the conclusions from Section 5 of the Toolkit and finally have some questions and answers at the end of the webinar session. Pardon the interruption, um, my computer was a little bit slow. Okay, so we're taking a look now at achieving the global transition to the energy efficient lighting toolkit. This is presently available as an e-book 
in English and Spanish. Soon we'll have it available in Arabic, French, and Russian. By popular demand, um, we are going to be focusing today on environmentally sound management. But I just want to mention that for government officials, energy agencies, environmental groups, distributors, retailers, and civil sector leaders, the entire toolkit is um, full of case studies, policy and technical tools. Um, it describes types of financing so that you can get your programs um, ready to go and have a budget um, that will cover all of the different aspects that you want to achieve. It gives guidance on ensuring product quality in the marketplace. Uh, as we'll know today, it focuses on environmental sustainability. Um, it has what we call our integrated policy approach, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I would like to acknowledge that it has contributions from many experts, including today's panelist. So I did mention the integrated policy approach. It's a bit of a puzzle. Um, many people are familiar with minimum energy performance standards that set a bar above which all products in the marketplace must conform. To achieve minimum energy performance standards, we often see programs such as labeling, communications, and we call those supporting policies. To make sure that products in the marketplace conform to the minimum energy performance standards and provide good quality and all the benefits that people are expecting, we recommend that there be monitoring, verification, and enforcement. But today we're focused on the corner that I have highlighted, environmentally sound management. In this section of the toolkit, we talk about lamp production, usage of lamps, and end-of-life issues. We also present the most recent information on carbon material and water consumption footprints. Mercury in lamps is an issue that people bring up. They're very concerned about the mercury in the lamps, but we also balance this with the reduction in mercury emissions from reduced fossil fuel combustion. So the chapter gives a lot of references and a lot of details on this. It's a way to help prepare your arguments so that you can make uh, informed decisions about what you will do in your countries. And finally, it gives advice on how to communicate technical issues to end users. So as I mentioned before, we look at three parts of the life cycle um, of lighting products. In production, we're looking at minimizing toxicity in design and manufacturing. During the usage phase, we're concerned about the entire environmental impact, and so we give information on breakage, how to avoid breakage, and what to do if a lamp breaks, if a lamp with mercury added to it breaks. At end of life, we're looking at best practices for management, and this is where um, our panelist, Mr. Enrique, is going to focus his presentation, and also on financing, how to set up um, the budget that you'll need so that you can have a sustainable program at the end of life or with what we call spent lamps. This chapter also includes international policies. In particular, I want to point out the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste, and also the ongoing um, UNEP-facilitated Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee on Reducing Mercury Pollution. Just briefly, we'll look at the types of lamps that are covered in this section of the toolkit. I'm not going to go into the details here, but there is text in the toolkit that describes the production of filament lamps, incandescent and tungsten halogen incandescent lamps. Then we look at compact fluorescent lamps, um, which do contain mercury. Um, and finally, we take a quick look at light emitting diodes. Uh, these do not contain mercury, but they do have a lot of other materials in them, and many questions come up. These are the newest type of lamp. So there are life cycle studies being done now. Some have already been published, and the toolkit references the ones that have been published. I'll also mention that when um, our new learning site is available, we'll be starting a blog so that we can keep you up to date on all the latest uh, literature that is published. Briefly, when we talk about the environmental impact of lamps during the usage phase, what we're really concerned about is the electricity consumption of inefficient lamps. This is the major environmental impact from lighting. 
the combustion of fossil fuels emits mercury into the atmosphere. Efficient lamps, however, reduce mercury emissions into the atmosphere because of their lower energy usage over the lifetime of these lamps. Concerning regulating hazardous substances, we see that the widespread adoption of efficient lamps brings a lot of attention to issues regarding hazardous substances. I'm sure that many of you have seen articles in the media, uh, may have spoken with family members or community members um, who ask you questions about mercury in lamps or about lead or about electronics. So each of these questions we try to address in the toolkit. There's certainly increasing government and public sensitivity to mercury and electronic waste concerns. Finally, I do want to point out that technical advances enable many lamp manufacturers to reduce the amount of lead, mercury, and other materials in their products. So in effect, the industry is leading efforts to green up their production and to make the products uh, have a lower impact on the environment, but also be more profitable in terms of reducing the expense of materials and reducing the expense of production. This in turn should lead to lower prices overall so that more people can benefit from using energy efficient lighting. I'll give a few examples, this is not a comprehensive list, but a few examples of regulation and voluntary initiatives that are helping to reduce the amount of mercury in energy efficient lamps, particularly in compact fluorescent lamps. The toolkit focuses mainly on the residential sector or consumer sector. And so we can see some of the major markets in the world, China, Europe, Russia, some very large countries, um, United States, and many others in, the, in these regions are reducing the amount of mercury in lamps by passing legislation that limits the amount of mercury in a particular type of CFL or in all CFLs or in all lamps, each of the laws vary a little bit. The amounts of mercury um, that are the maximum allowed in the lamp also varies. Some of the legislation has phase-in dates and becomes increasingly stringent. For example, the Restriction of Hazardous Substances Directive, otherwise known as ROSE, in Europe has established progressively lower levels of mercury for CFLs. These levels are updated every few years to reflect what's technically feasible. And again, I'll point out that the INC negotiations are presently considering a limit of 3.5 milligrams of mercury for lamps that are of 30 watts or less in input power demand. The United States has a slightly different approach. There is a voluntary industry initiative that has lowered CFL mercury levels. So overall, there is a lot of progress. There's a lot of possibility to further reduce the amount of mercury in lamps, and this is certainly something to take into account for each country that is considering legislation. I'm not going to focus much on spent lamps because this is our panelist specialty. I'll just point out that the toolkit does lay out a diagram that shows all phases of the life cycle, and the emphasis is on reducing release of mercury into the environment, collecting as much as possible, and then recovering the mercury and other materials and putting it back into production. We do acknowledge that in the future LED lamps are of concern and so we and other organizations are working together to lay out the life cycle for electronics and LEDs and this will be a supplement eventually to the toolkit. The main focus, of course, is avoiding the breakage of CFLs where CFLs are in use. In the toolkit, you'll find guidelines that are best practices um, taken from around the world and uh, put in a form that you can use directly. You can actually excerpt it and uh, use these guidelines for your own programs. In the toolkit, we outline a number of ways that programs can be financed. I will not go through these in, in great detail, but basically the full costs of recycling collection and re recycling can be internalized, but those costs are then passed on to end users. Another option is an advanced disposal fee, or you could have a deposit that is later refunded. 
A few other methods are uh, the last owner would pay, so the last uh, user, in effect, would make a fee, pay a fee for disposal, or you can have regional collection and recycling programs. And we'll see some really good examples of how this works out in, in reality um, when we go to the next speaker. So here are some conclusions from the end of the chapter, uh, section five. Efficient lamps are responsible for lower global mercury and greenhouse gas emissions than are the conventional incandescent lamps. The widespread adoption of efficient lamps requires sound management at all life cycle stages. And it's very important that compliant, high quality lamps are used to minimize the life cycle impacts, but also to deliver the expected benefits of efficient lighting. Policymakers can use the toolkit to consider international best practices as they determine what is best for their countries. But we do want to say that recycling is manageable, affordable, and can even create some new jobs. Extended producer responsibility is an effective approach. We hope you'll look at the Basel guidelines. They, they have to be complied with. And hazardous waste management is um, a complicated issue. But with the guidelines, uh, complying with them, you can eliminate the release of hazardous materials into the environment. And finally, we point out that success requires legislative frameworks. This integrated policy approach that we recommend sustainable funding, clear communication, and the participation of all parties. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn things back over to Laura Fuller. Thank you very much, Catherine. Excellent presentation. And now we're going to hear from Mr. Juan Carlos Enrique from Ambulamp, who will, who will um, give his presentation. Hello everybody. Hello everybody. My name is Juan Carlos Enrique, as mentioned, and I am managing Ambilan, which is an association of produce in Spain that started the collection system for lamps years ago. And I will try to explain, it will be a pleasure for me to explain our experience of these seven years, especially with the purpose to see if you can take some idea or some experience of these seven years that can be applicable in your country for the collection of recycling after the uh, elimination of incandescent lamps. So uh, first, a uh, general information related to uh, lamps, uh, to compact integrated lamps. Uh, uh, you know uh, that uh, in compact integrated uh, lamps uh, represent a very, very low uh, weight of the electronical and electrical waste. That means 80% of the, uh, this type of waste in pieces. In Abilam, we, we collect this year, this year, approximately, we will collect because it's not finished the year yet, approximately 2,000, 3,000 tons, which means uh, that uh, we have collected now from the beginning more than 10,000 10, tons. You can imagine, it uh, seems to be a, a difficult, a difficult quantity to, to, to identify if it is a high quantity or a low quantity. Usually we say that it's more than the weight of the uh, Eiffel Tower, or it's more than 30 times the Statue of Liberty. It means uh, that uh, for this kind of uh, small lamps, uh, uh, you can imagine that the volume is very big. Also in the year 2013, we have the ambition to have more than 100 million lamps collected in Spain. Okay, we will start now after this introduction with uh, the development of our system. Uh, and I will start with the first stone, the cornerstone of the whole system, which is legislation. I will spend some time in legislation, uh, the, especially to trying to, to, to explain you the legislation we have here. Probably it will be different than the legislation that you have in your country or the, the legislation you, you are planning to develop. But it's very important for us to explain how the legislation uh, influences the whole system. Now uh, we have an European and Spanish legislation. You know that this, uh, the system is that uh, in Europe is that uh, the, 
we have a central uh, legislation that is transposed to the countries, in this case to Spain. We have a directive on waste, the general law for, for waste, that uh, has been transposed in the general law the year 2011 in Spain. We have also a directive for uh, waste of electrical and electronic equipment that was transposed also in a royal decree in the year 2005, which is when we started uh, the, the, the development of something like But now we have also recast of this directive, uh, they are just uh, developed uh, recently, some months ago, and now this is ongoing in a transposition, in a future transposition for a new royal decree that probably is undergoing reform. Okay, but all the legislation is based on a, a, a one principle. It was mentioned by Kathleen, and the, this principle is the extended producer responsibility. Of course, you can decide if this is the principle in your country that must be used. You have different, but it's, we can say that it's working well in all the other countries. And uh, as far as I understood, in most of other countries out of the European Union are considering this as a, a, key, a key element for the development of the recycling system. What is, uh, what is the producer responsibility, extended, extended producer responsibility? It's a definition of the, uh, uh, that was in principle a uh, guideline given by the OECD and now is taken by the European Union as base of the whole legislation and uh, make responsible the producers for the total life cycle. It means that they are also responsible for financing and develop the recovery and recycling and disposal of their products when they, they, are, they, they generate the, this product generates gener waste. Uh, we have some governing principles. The first one is prevention of contamination, product life cycle, as mentioned before, and one important, very important one, the polluter pays. The guy or girl that is buying something is polluting, have some responsibility in the total circle, like a producer, for instance. And the ways of development of these systems are two, one is a collection and recycling system organization, which is AMBILAM. AMBILAM is what we name CRSO, Collection and Recycling System Organization, or an individual collection system, yeah, which is uh, a system developed by only one producer. What we can say is that uh, more than 99% of the producers in Spain and in Europe selected the first option, so they create collection and recycling systems organizations. What is a collection and recycling system organization. It's a non-profit organization formed by producers with the objective of creating a structure that fulfills all the financial, operational, legal and informative requirements established in their regulations. So now explaining the whole uh, structure of regulation in Spain related to waste and also in Europe, we can say that we have an European Waste Framework Directive. This uh, directive creates two directions. In one direction, the European sectoral uh, directives and the Spanish general law, the General Waste Act, that was created, as mentioned, in the year 2011. And taking both into consideration, the countries like Spain create a sectorial, subsectorial, uh, royal decrees in this case, or regulations. One is for used oils, another for used tires, batteries, double triple use, so electronic equipment, use packaging, etc. And now we are here. We are part of the W triple E. It means that LAMS is part of the of this waste and is regulated by this royal decree like uh, refrigerators, TVs or some other electronic devices. The most important contents of the, the royal decree and the new directive that is coming is that uh, we start with the, the, the present uh, royal decree. Uh, there is a collection target of uh, four kilos per inhabitant, uh, taking into consideration the collection and recycling of all electrical and electronic waste. Uh, the second one is that there are financial guarantees with respect to future waste. It means that the, uh, the, 
the final system of, uh, of the COSOs must take care not only of the waste uh, generated uh, in the present year, but also must create guarantees for the future waste. It means that, for instance, if a producer that is selling now a product uh, is going to bankrupt uh, next year, but uh, the, their products will produce waste in seven, eight years, somebody must take the money or the guarantee, the economical guarantee, to uh, recycle and collect this, this, this waste. And the third one is the obligation of the distribution to accept the waste one by one. What means one by one? Uh, the, 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 the distribution has the obligation to collect in their shop the waste of this product when some buyer is buying a similar product. So they are in the obligation to take one by one. If we see now the new European Directive, we can see that it is more restrict. It's going to, to have uh, different targets. When I say 45 POM, it means put on the market. So sales of uh, product. So for the year 2016 to 2019, there will be an increased quantity, starting with 45% of put on the market to be collected. And in the year 2019, must be 65% of the sales or a calculation of 85% of the waste in the real waste generated. Also, this new European directive uh, reinforces the financial guarantees and also create again the obligation of one by one in the distribution, but also creating a new obligation to shops that are uh, also selling this kind of products with more than 400 square meters. In this, in this case, uh, they must have free of charge, uh, uh, must, must provide uh, the possibility to give uh, this waste in a free way without the obligation to buy any uh, product for give this, this waste. Okay, as mentioned, uh, you know, because the Eco-Design Directive uh, it is uh, forbidden in Spain and in the rest of Europe on 1st of, of September 2012 the sale, production and sales of incandescent lamps. And we are going, of course, in the direction of uh, compact fluorescent lamps. May, may I say that 95, 90% is going in that direction, but also there are some sales of LED lamps. Uh, but in the coming years we expect uh, the transformation of incandescent lamps that are now in the houses to compact fluorescent lamps, especially because the LED lamps are very expensive now, and probably it will take some years, maybe five, six, seven, maybe ten years, to have a logical price to replace massively the, these lamps. Uh, also taking this into consideration, it's very important to consider the, uh, uh, another legal uh, obligation, which is the ROHS, restriction of hazardous substances that uh, uh, one of the, the most important things related in this obligation is the reduction of mercury, as mentioned also by Kathleen. And we can see that uh, in the last uh, years, there were a, a strong reduction of the content of mercury in the lamps that we are, both fluorescent lamps and compact integrated lamps, so saving lamps. Uh, it, these were reduced uh, more than 90%, and now uh, the, the lamps that are sold in the market uh, can, uh, can have approximately 5 milligrams or less of mercury. But you must think that the lamps that now are producing the waste are not the lamps, the new lamps that we are having now. The lamps that are producing waste are lamps that were installed 5 to 10 years ago. It means that we are collecting lamps with a big quantity of mercury still. Due to this, uh, these uh, hazardous substances uh, contain the uh, European Union decided to incorporate some kind of uh, lamps in the uh, scope of the directive, which are fluorescent lamps, discharge lamps, saving lamps, or compact fluorescent lamps, and also let's retrofit. But they decided because this uh, no content hazardous substances uh, out of the way of incandescent and allergen lamps. Okay, after the legislation, we will start to institution. Eh? What is Ambilam? How is organized Ambilam? Okay, Ambilam is a non-profit organization because it's a CRSO, 
and importers of lambs with more than 90% of market share in Spain. It was created by Philips or Ranch and Electric in Sylvania, like other CRSOs in Europe. Uh, as you can see in the graphic, we started with four producers in, uh, in Lambilam in the year 2005, and now uh, in November this year we are 180 producers and importers. Uh, the first question is when we decide uh, to launch uh, a specific, a specialized CRSO for lamps, was why a specific CRSO for lamps? Why not to mix the lamps with TVs or refrigerators? This is uh, the answer. The first thing is that the negative value of the waste is very important. Sometimes it's more costly uh, to, uh, uh, to collect and recycle lamps. So it's very important to make a very efficient collection and recycling system. As Nazarus waste, uh, as mentioned, uh, product or waste, is the fra fragility of this product is very important and is very difficult to handle. They have a specific and complicated shape. They have also a specific treatment plans, and we need to develop a specific collection system because sometimes we need to collect the lamps where the lamps are sold and they have a specific uh, channels for this. And it, also uh, the new technology that is mixed. The, the shape of the lamps with uh, LEDs now are very similar to the uh, non-LEDs one and are mixed and we need to provide also solutions for this. Okay, let's go now to the operations. So, the first part is the structure of the collection process. In principle, you need to have some principles for the collection system. Uh, the principles that we decided to have here in Avila was the implementation of multi-channel collection process, especially to ensure the proximity to the waste generation point, which is more efficient economically and ecologically. Also, we decided to have uh, two types of containers. Large one for cost efficiency, uh, wherever installation is possible and they have a space enough to have it, and a small that uh, brings the container closer to the citizen. And we can have in a, one of them close to our houses, in a, in a shop close to our houses. Development of special containers for the specific type of lamps. We have very different lamps. Maximum reduction of lamps breakages. This is very important. We must collect, we must take care that the lamps are not broken. Also an important issue is to give service to the maximum possible number of citizens. 99% service coverage throughout the country. Also a high degree of satisfaction among the collection points. If you have a collection point and you are not supplying a good service, probably this collection point will not be a collection point forever. They will decide not to be a collection point because you are not supplying a good service to him. And containers designed for logistical efficiency. If we see now the first one, I mean the large container, you can see in the photo that uh, it's very easy to assemble. It's important because, as mentioned before, these waste have a very high volume. So we need to save volume transport. How to save volume transport when the uh, containers are empty? We have the possibility to uh, fold, the, to fold the, 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 the container and in this case you are not uh, spending uh, money, neither spending uh, uh, petrol or whatever, uh, because you can collect a lot of them in, in, in a truck, for instance. It's light, they have long-lasting materials, it's very important to invest once and not to have to change these uh, containers many times. Traceability of the container is very important because we have hazardous uh, uh, waste. It means that we must know exactly where are all the containers and adapt it to all different types of lamps. You can see in the overhead that we have uh, some chips in the containers, we have two in each container, then is uh, automatically uh, sending a signal uh, by uh, satellite, so a telephone, a telephone signal, and we immediately know uh, uh, just in time uh, the control of the place, the placing of all our containers. Related to the small containers must be cheap, you have there, I can explain for a lot of things on them, but I will try to con to concentrate the most important things. Must be cheap. Also is a communication element, especially at the beginning, the first years, when people don't know uh, that the lamps must be collected. Uh, 
they are everywhere, so there must be a communication element. And there must be a separation of fluorescent and saving lamps, because don't mix very well, and there could be breakages. And in the, as you can see in the image, it's very important to provide an anti-breakage ramp system, because if no, if you, whatever kind of container you, 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 you place in the shops, the lamps are broken, at least you, you have this system. And must be also foldable and easy to assemble. You see here different type of different containers for a, for a specific type of lamps, a container for long, long uh, fluorescent tubes, longer than normal fluorescent tubes, discharge lamps for street lighting, for instance, or installer storage containers that are bigger than the smaller for the shelves. Also, you have here a multi-product container where we collect in the big retails. I mean Carrefour, Le Bois Metron, or whatever, uh, a mix of different type of uh, uh, small uh, waste. For instance, you have here a container with batteries, small appliances, and lighting, including fluorescent tubes and compact fluorescent lamps. Due to this multi-channel approach, we have uh, installed in, in different channels the large container in a whole wholesale electrical distribution large installers in occasional lamping. It means when you need a, a big replacement of uh, lamps, for instance, in a big period, and we send occasional uh, containers just in time to take uh, once all these lamps uh, when, they, when they need uh, the containers in time. <coughs> Sorry. In large users, for instance, in big industries or big uh, uh, buildings. Also, we have uh, the, the big container in large retailer outlets, I mean for their own installations, not for their clients, but for, for their own installations. And also we have recycling in recycling centers, municipal recycling centers. And the small container is installed especially in all these uh, shops where the lamps are sold. We think that the best moment to, to throw it away, to throw away the, the, the waste of a lamp, is when you say, hey, I want to buy these lamps is similar to this one. Please, give me a lamp similar to this one. So, at this very moment, you buy the lamp and you have to your disposal a container for lamps in the shop. And also, we have uh, in the small and medium size these electrical installers. When we started with the development of this network, we prepared an analysis of the necessities in the uh, Spanish uh, territory for the coverage of the 90% of the national territory with these small containers. And we, the, the study, the analysis, told us that uh, we needed close to 9,000 collection points to cover 90% of the territory. Finally, we decided to go further, and we are now, as mentioned, uh, giving service to 99%. And as you see, this is the development of big containers and small containers uh, till now in and beyond. Uh, for the year 2012, we have 8,400 uh, big containers and big collection points, because we have some more containers than this one, and uh, 1,700, uh, sorry, 17,000, more than 17,000 collection points for uh, small containers, which means that we are giving uh, a collection point per 4,000 inhabitants, approximately something less in Spain. What is the collection tonnage in the development? You remember that we have the target of 4 kilos per inhabitant. It was achieved uh, in the year 2011, but we need to continue the growing to, uh, in the year 2018 to have a 65% of the market or 85% of the waste generated, which means that we must to grow from 2,300 tons in the year 2012 to close to 4,000 tons in the year 2019. Okay, then with recycling, we can tell you that uh, we have five recycling plants uh, in Spain. Some of them are private, some of them are semi-private, it means public, uh, the public sector share part of this, and some of them are totally public. In the recycling process, uh, the most important thing, one of the most important things is the separation of the mercury. We must make a very responsible, very responsible process. So uh, this uh, means that we make a, a classification of all the material that are coming from the, our containers. Sometimes you can find, I don't know, cartoon uh, glasses, or sometimes 
I don't know, the sandwich. Eh? So we need to we need to separate all these things and then uh, to uh, they make it contamination and recycling of all materials with a mercury distillation. What we obtain is 84% glass, 9% metal, 3% fluorescent powders and 4% plastic. And within fluorescent powders, these three, 3.5% 3 that we have, 50 to 20% of these waste are rare edge. And we are separating also the rare earths because it's a very important material for uh, making, uh, again, lamps or making a lot of new electrical and electronical equipment. This is what we do with the uh, with, uh, glass, with the mercury. What we are doing, the, 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 the mercury is going to security warehouse, a very important warehouse that is placed in Spain, where they are developing a special system for net neutralizing this, uh, this mercury. And uh, the glass uh, is used, and the mercury can be used also for the creation of new lamps, and the glass also for, uh, for the new lamps also, and also for uh, glass uh, bottles or whatever in the cement industry, and other metals that are going to metal foundries and the plastic to the plastic industry. Now related to information and awareness raising. The main message is that it's very important, very important to communicate what you are doing. If people don't know that you are uh, placing a lot of containers, nobody will put the lamps in the containers. So you need to have uh, a, a very important action in communication, especially the first years. And then with the first information, first simply say that you, in our experience, it's very important for them to, to understand where are the containers placed. Then the second one is motivation. Explain, we try to explain why it's so important that they don't throw it away, but simply put this waste in our containers. Then first, industrial, because the percentage of collection is higher in industrial than in domestic, and then domestic. And then you can see our plan from the year 2007 to the year 2014, and where you can find the main targets where we are using. We must take into consideration all the stakeholders. For instance, and we have some educational experience. You have here a live recycling roadshow for five months all around Spain. With the professional education that we had with uh, the 63,000 students of uh, electricity, and uh, now we have a three years uh, a recycling school directed to more than 300,000 students and more than 18,000 teachers. This is a kind of advertising for professionals. Also, you must uh, incorporate or you must think that it's important to, to, to explain the, the professional, the electrical installers or so on, that uh, it, it's very good for everybody to, to collect the lamps and that they have now the opportunity to do that. Then I have a mass media campaign that we, we had and I will try to open a spot TV of 20 seconds, and I hope you can hear that. Okay, and we have uh, also another one very similar for the saving lamp. Okay, you have also some examples of outdoor, uh, outdoor advertising, and also we have it in, where you are invited to visit our web, www.ambilan.es, and you can find a Google Maps for the collection points location and search. 
financing. Financing is a very important thing. You must find in the your legislation a way via taxes, via responsibility, extend the responsibility to producers, but you need to have a very strong and clear uh, financing system. The situation we have in Ambilam is that the consumer is paying to the distribution because the law is the responsibility. The distribution paid to the producer and the provision is paid to Ambilam every three months. And we have a register of products, uh, producers uh, in the Ministry of Industry and these producers every three months say to the Ministry what they are selling. And they pay to Ambilam for the collection and recycling depending the sales that they are having every three months. Also when we have this fee, the, the amount of money that Ambilam has the per land to the, to the producers and as mentioned before, we use this money for two things. To pay the cost of the historical old waste, the, the, what we have this year, and also to have a provision for the cost of the future waste in the coming years. And then, last but not least, also to give you a vision, which can be useful for you, of what we think that are the key success factors for having the development of this system. The first one is the vision. Is efficiency the most important thing, or is the social service the most important thing? To provide the citizens the, this service. In our opinion, both things are important, and you need to balance both. Efficiency only don't work. Social service paying whatever don't work. The second one is how the stakeholders perceive the service. You can see that it is very important to measure every every year how the opinion of the stakeholders is related to your service, trying to improve every year because it's, it's very necessary the collaboration of all the stakeholders. You can see here some punctuations from Ambilam. Another very important thing, especially in the first years, is the internal control of the organization. When you start, you have a lot of things to do, a lot of money in your hands, but you need to invest, you need to control also the, the organization. If we have some results here of a 360 degrees audits that has been taken by Ambilam with a maximum five in uh, as a score, and we had uh, this uh, qualification that the first years we haven't that. We need to build up in the, the first years uh, all the internal control of the organization. Then you have another very important one, which is to fight the free riders in collaboration with the government. Some of the producers will not pay. You need to detect and uh, demand that they must uh, pay for the, the maintenance of the system, unless the others will pay for, for them. You must have sufficient amounts invested in communication, as, as mentioned, implication of administration distribution, and also social agents, I mean NGOs, for instance. And the visibility of the fee is something that ensures the uh, financing system. And last but not least at all, adequate, as we started, adequate, reasonable, and agreed legislation. So, thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Juan Carlos. And um, I am going to now open it up for questions. So um, we've got, we did receive some excellent questions, and we're going to use the remaining time to, um, to ask these questions. We don't have very much time, but uh, the first question then uh, I'm going to direct to you, Juan Carlos, which is how do we start a CRSO in our country? Okay, I, I, think, I think that the, the start needs to have clarity on the uh, targets the government have and the legislation to obtain these targets. I had the opportunity to discuss with the Chile government some uh, months ago and they had a general, uh, a general law for waste. So uh, they decided to have a specific law for uh, the waste of collection of plants, and they will later on uh, develop a general uh, recycling law, because it's so important to have the regulation in this. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And actually, a related question to that is, um, where is the majority of effort required to make a CRSO work?
Okay. Uh, it depends. Uh, uh, the creation of CSO is a kind of project. It's a 10 year project. And you have different phases. At the beginning, you need to concentrate your effort in involving everybody. I mean distribution, involving producers, involving the government, involving the NGOs. And we name this first phase the breakage of resistances. For the second phase, the most important thing is the building up of uh, uh, the awareness, the information and the awareness about the, the, uh, the recycling of lamps. You need to create uh, the idea in the population, in the, in the industries and so on, that is very necessary to recycle lamps and how to do that, yeah? to explain very clearly. We name this phase uh, launching the system. And we have a third phase which is the phase of efficiency. Of course, in all the phases, efficiency is a key. You must make things with efficiency, collection, recycling, saving the maximum quantity of money, but it's especially more important after three or four years launching. When the, when the system is growing, you have big quantities of tons collected, and you need to refine very well the cost. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Now, we only have time for one more question. And just to assure the audience, for any questions that we don't get to today, we will get back to you uh, directly by email. So rest assured that your questions will be answered. Um, the next question that I would like to address to Catherine is, um, when you set 2016 as a target phase out of inefficient lighting, does it mean the countries have to start banning of GLS lamps in 2016? And there's a second and third part. How long will the banning process be? Will it be four years long like in the EU? Thank you for this uh, somewhat complex question. I'll try to answer briefly. Um, countries are at different places in their phase-out plans. Um, we have a policy map that shows on our website um, what the different laws are and what the different progress is in each country. I want to point out that um, we really advocate an integrated policy approach. And so when a phase-out is scheduled, you also need to take into account um, the environmentally sound management of products, which is what we focused on today, but also monitoring verification and enforcement. Um, Enrique, Mr. Enrique focused a little bit on that, and the supporting policies, which he, he showed some wonderful examples of. So the phase out can be very rapid, as it was, uh, for example, in Cuba. It was sort of a change out there, or it can be scheduled over a period of years. Many countries are uh, developing countries are debating whether or not to do a rapid transition to efficient lighting or to take things more slowly. Budget constraints are certainly um, something that will be a concern, but there are also great opportunities with new efficient lamps. So leapfrogging is a possibility. Thank you for the question and thank you very much for all of you who've listened. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone very much on behalf of the Enlightened Initiative. I'd like to thank our speakers and our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We've had a terrific audience and we really appreciate your time. I invite all attendees to check out the Enlightened website over the next few weeks if you would like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations. Um, if your country is not already a member of the Global Efficient Lighting Partnership, we encourage you to join. We also offer expert policy assistance and the ability for you to subscribe to our newsletter and participate in one webinars. So please have a wonderful day and we hope to see you again at future Enlightened events. This concludes our webinar.